Because technology has made our pursuit of immediate gratification impossibly easy, we've started sacrificing what would be our most precious moments in the future for good enough moments now. Instead of investing in the types of positive experiences that could bring us into flow, allow us to develop rich, positive relationships, or deep personal satisfaction, we're increasingly chasing the experiences that make us feel great in the moment, yet are ultimately ephemeral. There are three classes of positive experiences that humans can have, and these classes exist in a hierarchy where a higher tier experience is qualitatively better than that of a lower tier, but also harder to reproduce. Experiences of the very lowest tier we know essentially from birth, from mother's milk to that piece of candy that you could always get from grandma to the toy that you always wanted. As we grow older, the nature of these experiences don't really change all that much. Just think about that decadent piece of chocolate cake or the expensive shoes that match your wardrobe or the latest shiny smartphone. These are all things that make us feel great, and yet these experiences can be produced at will through purchase, exchange, or some other type of transaction. The second tier comprises experiences that are universally better than those of the first and known to nearly all of us. Not only do these experiences fill us with positive emotion, but they're amongst the most amazing experiences that we can have, and therefore they make our lives richer. The trick is, however, these experiences cannot be produced at will, and most of us don't quite understand the conditions under which they emerge. But it is the second tier of experiences that comprises our most cherished memories. I mean, we've all had a night out with friends that was so perfect and so great that the time just flew by and you never wanted the night to end. Or maybe you've been on a first date thinking that you'd get to know the person at least, yet by the end of the night it felt as though you'd known them your entire lives. For my team sports athletes, I'm sure you know the feeling that you get when you finally get to crush your bitter rivals. I mean, how could you compare that to anything? I was a junior varsity rower in college and I remember a particular regatta that we had on the Schuylkill River right here in Philadelphia. Harvard and Yale always take the top spot, so no one had any ideas that we might be the first boat to cross. But if we could just be in the top 10 in our weight class, that would feel like a real victory. We had a good understanding of who our collegiate competition was, and so it seemed reasonable that we might actually be in the top 10. But there was one boat that wasn't on our radar. Not only did this team rank higher than we did, it seemed as if they might actually knock us out of the competition. This team also had this very peculiar ability to cause massive eye rolling in all of the other teams because whenever they would pull their boats out of the water, they would yell, go Navy. But like in a much more obnoxious form, go Navy! I mean, if you had to have another team in your crosshairs, I can't think of a better candidate. From the outset of the race, Navy put enough distance between their boat and ours that it was clear that there was no hope. I mean, you have to understand that the head of the school kill is a hard race. This is 4,000 meters of grueling physical exhaustion, I mean, to the point where it feels like your muscles are on fire. I'd say about 1,000 meters from the finish, McBride sticks his oar too deep in the water, which causes it to snap back, strike him in the chest, and tosses him completely out of the boat. Now we are officially a man overboard. Without missing a beat, a crewmate just pulls his oar right back into the boat, and we continue rowing, with now as a crew of seven. About 500 meters from the finish, our coxswain starts to yell every conceivable obscenity at us. I mean, she wants us to dig deep. A coxswain is to a crew sort of like what a conductor is to an orchestra. You're not going to let these kindly competitors beat us, are you? I mean, please note that kindly competitors, that's the clean version. As we get close enough to the boat in front of us, it, it's clear that it's Navy. And so now we have to dig deep. I mean, now we have to give every bit of every ounce of everything that we can muster. I mean, my body was going to explode. Through some unknown, unbelievable miracle, I mean, just as we're crossing the finish, we managed to edge out Navy. Back on shore, we are obliterated with exhaustion. One guy's actually vomiting, uh, and McBride is making his way back to shore. 
By the time we get home, uh, we're completely dead to the world. But we're also a little giddy. We're elated. We were riding high for weeks because we were able to edge out Navy. Now, let me ask you this. When was the last time that you were riding high for weeks because of a pair of shoes that you bought? I'm willing to guess that the answer is never. I mean, I could trot out all the empirical data that proves that these tier two experiences will have a greater impact on your life than tier one experiences, but I suspect you already know this. You already know that the feeling that you get from the most delicious meal in the world can't possibly compare to crushing your bitter rivals. You know that the feeling that you get from wearing your new coat around town, even if you get loads of compliments, that that can't compare to the look on the face of your snaggletooth daughter as she's beaming with pride at the school play. You already know this. And so there is the set of amazing experiences that we can have, and these are the experiences that drive the whole of the human drama, especially happy endings. I mean, happy endings are about unions and reunions. They're about triumphs and victories, transformation, finding meaning, and achieving our goals. There simply is no story where the girl at the end of the story finally gets the handbag that she always wanted. No one would watch a movie where the protagonist, at the very climax, buys the expensive status luxury car. And obviously, no one on her deathbed is going to regale us with stories of pastrami because it had the right amount of pepper. No one tells these stories because no one cares. Our tier one experiences are the least important and least memorable of all of our positive experiences. And yet more and more, we're dedicating a bigger chunk of our time and mental energy to these types of pursuits. And we're doing too much. We're dabbling in too many things. We're chasing too many quick hits of dopamine. And it's killing our tier two experiences of happiness. But don't worry. I'll tell you how to prime your conditions to have more tier two experiences and how to make them last longer. There is yet a third tier which is so transcendent that it invariably changes the lives of anyone who dips their toe in. These are the mystical experiences, which, as you may well know, are notoriously hard to put into words. I mean, how do you really convey the idea of becoming one with the universe anyway? Here's what I will say about this very top tier of experiences, though. They are real, and they are reproducible they are qualitatively better than all of the other types of experiences, and they're available for anyone who wants to pursue them. I guess I'd also like to say a little bit about the very bottom tier. It's mostly straightforward, but there are some insights to be had. There is a law of diminishing marginal utility that tells us that the satisfaction that you'll get from a second dessert won't be nearly as great as that from a first dessert. Now, people are smart enough to not try to get all their meet, needs met by dessert. I mean, if you're savvy, you can do dinner and dessert. I mean, if you're really savvy, you can do dinner, dessert, maybe a movie, even a nightcap. Surely, where we try to get all of our needs met by one thing, we would habituate, but that's not what happens, right? We learned how to mix it up. If there's one insight that early religious thinkers were wise to notice, is that these pleasures of the flesh, even if they're different in their nature or their form, they're essentially the same in their substance. They all occupy the same tier of positive experience. But does this mean that we have to abandon or give up our pursuit of tier one experiences or hedonic pleasures? Absolutely not. I mean, the little comforts and delights in life are a critical part of our well-being. We've been exploiting our pension for these types of things since the very beginning of human culture. I mean, what would food and music, dance and dress, any of the hallmarks of culture, what would any of these things be where there are no tier one experiences or hedonic pleasures to be had? What's different now, however, is the large scale mass consumerism that started at the beginning of the 20th century and then exploded after World War II. Mass consumer gave us the ability to consume and have tier one experiences all the time. Now we can get our hedonic needs met whenever we want. And that's not how we evolved. 
Mass consumerism also gave us the powerful advertising and marketing industries, which have made a science out of capturing our attention and then diverting that to their products. But now there's a new, different kind of player in town that is also interested in our attention, social media. Social media is different because it, it doesn't give us these substantial hits of dopamine like consumption or buying something. Instead, we get a small, slow trickle of dopamine over time. Look, I, I know that the ills of social media have been talked about at length, if not ad nauseum. But what doesn't seem to get mentioned is the fact that our pursuit of these social media thrills are in direct conflict with our ability to pursue these tier two interests. Here's how the conflict works. The conditions for producing authentic happiness require us to commit to some level of sustained effort or concentration, often over a significant period of time. This is necessary not just to acquire a skill or a hobby, but often even to practice that skill. But sustained effort and concentration are under assault right now. I mean, we've seen the gradual decrease in the number of people who are taking up traditional instruments like guitar or piano or oboe. Uh, and this is reflected in the nationwide decline of sales of these types of instruments, as well as the shuttering of these types of stores. We also know from university professors across the country that there's been a decrease in the quality of writing and long form reading ability of newer classes of freshmen. Uh, and there's a Danish study that suggests that the constant production of news and information has decreased our collective attention span, as well as how long we're willing to listen to a particular subject. You know, with all of the information and the onslaught of likes and notifications, it's not just our attention span that has become thin, but also our patience. But it's exactly patience and attention and perseverance that's necessary to learn a skill like guitar or even listening deeply, you know, paying close attention to a conversation without looking at our phones, or investing in a relationship and not ghosting people. Our fractured attention and this slow drip of dopamine is disincentivizing our pursuits of tier two forms of happiness. We're doing too much, we're too distracted. So what do we do to have more authentic happiness in our lives? Less. We do less. Look, we don't really need to be a big deal on every social media platform. We don't really need to know everything that's trending at every moment. Well, the glamour shots, the lip injections, the shout outs, the collaborations, the food pics, I'm sorry, the foodie pics. We're doing too much and it's killing our happiness. Instead, we need to do less. Go back to the basics double down on the interests and the hobbies and the skills that we already have. Invest in those. We can set goals inside of our practice. Setting up goals internal to a practice is a great way to find flow and engagement. If you play the piano, how fast could you play a given piece? Could you beat that time? Is there a piece that you've always struggled to master? Master it. Let's say you're a runner. What would it take for you to beat your fastest mile or achieve your personal best? What would it take to achieve your personal best in any area of life? Master it. Invest in a night out with your friends where nobody checks their phone for the entire night. I mean, check with your spouses first, but just be with each other. Delight in and enjoy a beautiful, elaborate meal and savor it without anyone taking pictures for the gram. Just be in the moment. In our current context, our mindless pursuit of immediate gratification is undermining our most precious forms of happiness. But if we can just double down and invest in the things that already matter, the solution is simple. Do less.